academic integrity in African context. As I looked at this topic, I had a lot of struggles as to how to limit the focus. But I tried to raise some questions that have to do with research, integrity. Um, and so I start with a question, is plagiarism a moral or integrity issue? And we all need to struggle with this question. Responses come to this question in various ways, uh, oftentimes informed by our modes of teaching and other factors. So I want to reflect on this question in some ways, raise issues for us to think about and see how we can provide uh, a meaningful response to this question. And the second thing there on the first page is uh, a definition of plagiarism, a rough one. Uh, plagiarism is defined as academic theft, and it's an act that is very complex. Generally, when you lift content, form, structure from other sources without appropriate reference or without reference at all uh, is considered plagiarism. There are those who feel that uh, unconscious borrowing should be excused. Uh, but we'll reflect on some of the issues that come with that. Some more questions are raised. How much borrowing can be done without reference to sources? How much reference should be given? Is there any knowledge that is original to a particular researcher? Is knowledge not a virtual reality? Can there not be intuition that appears replicating earlier research, earlier reflections? And how do we manage that? How do we identify it? Um, how do we respond to it when it happens? Are students being victimized or held responsible for plagiarism or when, when, when they are held responsible? It is difficult to argue that one can use an information from others without knowing that it is not theirs. Uh, oftentimes, the actual source may not come to mind, but you readily can tell that I, I learned this somewhere else. So in teaching research, I've al always asked the students to, to ask themselves, am I the original uh, source of this? Uh, even if you cannot readily call to mind where you heard it or where you saw it, where you read it, you can tell that this is not mine. Uh, when you, in Africa, we dry our clothes outside, and that's strange for some. Uh, <laughs> but when you live in a community and you dry your clothes and you go to pick them, do you mistake your shirt? I think if we think in those terms, when we reflect on what people have written, have presented, has researched on, we'll be able to uh, be at top of managing uh, issues of plagiarism when we see them. The identity of plagiarism is complicated in Africa as a result of traditional modes of transmission of knowledge. <laughs> the folk tales. There are stories about wisdom, love, hospitality, marriage, obedience, etc. These are used to communicate morals in society. They are repeated stories intended to, re to, re to be retold in I mean, from one generation to another, to build the morals of a society. 
the interest is in the morals being inculcated through these stories and not the owner of the stories. The end value of the body of knowledge is the concern. What do people learn? What, what do they gain? How will they change through the content? And no one gives serious attention in this kind of context to who owns the idea. And so when someone from this context comes to an academic setting, it's, it's actually difficult to understand the expectations uh, that, that inform uh, plagiarism. I've, I've heard so many stories from Africa relating to moral values and the rest of them. And I'm not sure anybody can trace where they came from. And Africa has a lot of sayings, songs, expressions uh, through which communications are made, lives are built, and just difficult to tell who owns it. And so when you ask the student to tell where you get this story from, it can be a very challenging um, request or expectation. So, this reflection identifies the factors responsible and steps that could be taken to curb plagiarism in African context. This presentation is given based on observations and general expressions in research classes, the questions students ask, the factors that inform the questions they ask, the general reaction towards institutional efforts at curbing the act. It is also an invitation um, to discuss in this forum, Apton, and intended to harness insight in responding to the challenge of plagiarism. Factors responsible for the compromise of academic integrity. Number one, when in our teaching, learning, attention is given to success and financial gains over against acquisition of skills and competence. There are some who always want to have the certificate. We've had something like that yesterday. Uh, they want to pass their exams. They want to have an A in the papers, but they, they have not been introduced or they are not willing to acquire skills that will help them do the work. And they see something that looks like what they are looking for, they just put it together to make sure they write a paper. And um, this leads to plagiarism. Also, inadequate exposure of students to standard academic practice. The first one is on the student. The second is on the teacher. When the teaching of research is done in a way that uh, students are not exposed on proper ways of doing research. Uh, principles that will guide them in proper research. Uh, ensuring that research is discovery, is investigation, rather than um, providing information. Uh, and they will be motivated, and they will be able to get skills that will empower them to actually search out and discover. And it will be an interesting thing for them. Ill-prepared teaching. Uh, sometimes it's not the fault of the teacher, but maybe for lack of human resources, um, someone who had no training in teacher education 
no training in research, is asked to teach a research class. And so he depends on the fact that he had written a paper in the past. <laughs> and will not be able to help the students to acquire the skills that are helpful in avoiding plagiarism. Cultural definition of honesty. Now by this, I do not mean that African cultures do not value honesty. Um, it, it's just what, what is acceptable and what's the objective. As mentioned in the introduction, uh, the, um, the context of Africa is such that when you have an information, you have something, a resource, others are welcome to make use of it to meet a need. Okay. But they are not welcome to distribute, to sell. I remember in African villages in time past, you can be walking by a farm, of fruit, you have a right to pluck and eat. Even if the farmer sees you, he's not going to blame you for stealing. You are taking of the fruit to eat right there. And you do not need to ask him. Okay. Um, but if you take the fruit, put in your bag, then you've done the wrong thing. Uh, and, and I think that kind of idea with, with the context that stories are used to communicate, um, poems and expressions are used to build morals and not so much emphasis on authorship. Uh, sometimes these, these forms, these modes are transformed into or transposed into uh, research life and make people take things, not necessarily because they want to take them and steal them, but because they feel this is useful for me and I can make use of it and I don't think anything is wrong with it. Because in this context, nobody fights over ownership of ideas. And so, um, but he, he fails in recognizing that uh, the world of research is a different one and uh, does not help much. Still some more factors. Mode of teaching, learning, and that is set in place, can also encourage plagiarism. When, uh, one of the comments I made yesterday, when we teach with the intention that students are expected to go and replicate what they learn, Oftentimes, they end up plagiarizing in their research work. Uh, but when we give them tools so they can, they can be independent researchers, so they can investigate for themselves, then they'll be able to get out of it. And if, if we are using the traditional African modes of mentoring, of storytelling, of rote learning, of dictation, I mean, of memorization uh, forms of learning, which, which is actually one of the general modes that we see in lower uh, literate levels of education. Uh, the tendency that uh, such a student would, be, would, would fall prey to plagiarism is very high. And so uh, revisiting our modes of teaching will be very helpful. Careless approach to research. There are some who will actually do research without taking serious note of the source information when they take notes. And when they get to the writing stage, they fall prey to some of the challenges associated with this issue. Compromise in regard to entry requirements. Uh, here again, uh, each of the institutions have entry requirements uh, that, that gives some kind of uh, start, start of competence for research at various levels of study. And if institutions for either for the reason of having more students or having more resources through their fees uh, are 
are under pressure to lower their standards, uh, that can lead to some serious issues of plagiarism because the student will be expected to perform at a level he's not prepared for. And it can lead the student to fall into issues of plagiarism. Inadequate supervision, also, when supervisors do not have enough time to thoroughly go through the research that the students are writing um, and are not able to, for instance, have a system of verification of their sources and content uh, through assessments, uh, the students are likely to fall prey to issues of plagiarism when less attention that than is required is given, is given to the students. Dealing with issues not contextually cogent could also lead to plagiarism. Where, for instance, the, the student's concern is how do, I, how do I respond to issues of reappearances, ghosts, ancestors, in eschatology, okay? How do I relate that to resurrection? And then the professor does not give concerns in those directions, but he's talking about resurrection, life after death. Now, it's, what about these other modes of expressions of life after death that we see in Africa or we hear about or we, you know, you have stories of someone say, a person died in uh, Nairobi and someone saw him in Kenya, I mean, in somewhere else. Uh, is it possible? Does it happen? We have such stories in Africa and we have people tell experiences of those kinds of things. And so um, when, when you are dealing with a subject and you do not relate that subject to the context and you ask students to do research on such subjects, uh, the tendency is to simply go copy what others have written about those things because it's not real concrete. Uh, that might not be a good example that I have given, but when you have, when you have a struggle dealing with an issue that is completely abstract, does not respond to the existential need of, of the community, of the students who are engaged in research, uh, they are likely to uh, fall into this uh, problem. Common forms of plagiarism. I did not want to give much time to this, but just felt like it's good to have a mention of some of them, copy and paste uh, kind of uh, work, both large and small, uh, sometimes with quotation marks without reference, or without quotation marks, uh, even with a reference, uh, forms of plagiarism. Lifting words, ideas, structures, paraphrases, um, and over-dependency, uh, quote and quote again, padding of information, very similar to paraphrasing, but you bring ideas, put them together, several people's ideas, mix them up, uh, you know, can be a problem and you, you, you struggle with who do you give the credit and some of those issues. Uh, the last one, it's sometimes you have students or researchers asking someone else to do the research for them and they pay them or or they steal them. <laughs> um, <laughs> they remove the title page and fix a new one <laughs> and submit. So we have various forms of plagiarism that um, we see reflecting. These are major examples. Institutions, res institutions responses to these are informed by how much they are aware of the challenge. Some institutions have rules about management of plagiarism, but many do not. And those who have, some of them do not have elaborate uh, 
description of what to do or how to handle it. And those who do not have, I think we need to have uh, rules that will guide them. Here is an example of a statement in a catalog about what they will do. Each student is expected to do his own work in preparation for the successful fulfillment of all academic requirements of the courses in which he is enrolled or he or she is enrolled. Any form of cheating, whether in exams, tests, term papers, projects, reports, otherwise, will be dealt with severely and may lead to expulsion or dismissal. The remaining part of that quote is a description of the cheating, the stealing um, in the quote. I group the responses to these four. Accommodation. I, I, I struggle with terminologies in grouping this, so please you can modify them with little explanations that I will make. Uh, is it, uh, the first one is where you accept it. You don't see any problem with it. You don't check it. Um, I've asked them to write a paper. They've written a paper. I've seen the paper. It's related to what I want them to see, to know, and let everyone go. And that's, that's a dangerous response. Um, it, it's a response that have failed to see the, the issue of plagiarism as a moral, ethical issue that um, calls to question the integrity of the researcher. The second one, mild punishment or mild response, is where, well, uh, since you have plagiarized in this course, you repeat the course. That's just it. Or you repeat a year or a semester, or you fail the course and retake the course. Okay. Harsh response um, could be expulsion or withdrawal of certificates. Okay. These two, number two and three, actually oftentimes do not have a redemptive dimension. Uh, they get you out of the system, go do what you want to do with your life. And I think, I, I, I like to go with the last one, some kind of finding some way in which, in which we can... Um, guide, help, discover some of the factors that may have led to such plagiarism and see what we can do about it uh, to get the person off of it. Um, even if it means restarting the study all over or give him some time and, and do some follow-up to help him because when you just send him away, uh, he has learned something. He may still want to, well, that school didn't like me and still continue to write and publish and take people's material and use them the way he like without references. But it, if, if we have a way in which we can, we, we can have a restorative plan uh, to help the person out of the challenge of uh, taking people's uh, work, for granted, it's going to be very helpful. But again, this house can discuss this and find a much more relevant uh, response. Measures towards academic integrity. I actually like to pitch my tent with the first one. There's a need to give attention to the spiritual state of the student. I think if we 
encourage churches to recommend people who have actually known Jesus as Lord and Savior and have been discipled and through effective teaching and some of the other factors that we will look at, we, we will be able to stem down issues of uh, plagiarism, lack of academic integrity. They can understand that this is not yours, you've got to give credit, and they are teachable. There are times we have students in the seminaries, Bible schools, who probably have not known Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. And it's sometimes because people who recommend them have seen them very active physically, but they have not made personal commitments to Christ. In my life as a teacher, I've had to interview students for seminary enrollment, and I can say over a period of uh, 22 years that I've been teaching, I've seen like four or five cases of those who do not know Christ personally coming to seminary. Uh, um, and sometimes, some of them had gone to some Bible school before they come to the seminary. Some of them are very active in terms of activities in the churches they came from. Um, and so it will be difficult to teach such. Uh, or if you do teach them and they learn, they are learning simply like anyone could learn in a university. Have information, know things, be able to handle things, um, and, and not really ministry. And if, if we place emphasis on this, then we'll be able to achieve greater, greater end result uh, in authentic, biblically sound research for our contexts. Secondly, identify causative factors in each setting and consciously provide an appropriate response to it. Some of these factors were discussed in the second part of this presentation. We looked at causative factors there. Three, adopting effective teaching learning approaches. We need to come to a point, I feel, where we, um, we look at these modes of teaching Sometimes this issue of desiring that your students go to replicate what they have learned uh, leads us to use approaches of teaching learning uh, that, um, that do not help them in being themselves when they research. They're not able to respond to issues on their own. They cannot be independent researchers. And so they, they try to retell the stories of their learning, of their, of their work, in ways that are very dependent on other people. Four, engage or engaging adequately prepared research teachers. Five, uphold standard of entry requirements in the schools. And I think this is where having different levels of schools might be helpful for those who cannot fit into some high level of research training, can go to lower ones where they are not required to write, uh, and can grow up in, in those processes. I feel on one part of me that even those who had gone high in study and research should be able to teach in a very low setting, very low levels. And I think sometimes we make a mistake of thinking that if I have a degree, then I cannot go and teach in a local language school. I think even a professor does that, can do that. I was talking with a professor from Nigeria yesterday 
and he was talking about uh, teaching in some of those mission schools, small uh, level academic uh, women who virtually didn't go to school and having to teach them uh, what one word in English, what it means in Hausa language. And that's, that's something encouraging. That's something our educated elite uh, can do. Um, it, we are not expected to just teach those who are up high there and have no touch with those who are down there in terms of their academic exposures. So I, I think if we're able to do that, it will help us a great deal deal with issues of plagiarism. Uphold, okay, and next one, thorough supervision of our students. And then last one, adopting or developing effective IT technique. Uh, in Africa, uh, this is still um, at the beginning stages. Programs like um, Turn It In um, and other forms that other 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 programs, IT programs that can help in in looking at levels of plagiarism, uh, Grammarly, uh, some of those programs. Many of them are not uh, are not available in Africa, or at least. Our researchers in Africa are not aware about some of these that will help them with uh, managing some of these issues of uh, plagiarism. And I think we should be going there and help because one of the challenges most institutions in Africa have is uh, how do I easily detect that this is a stolen idea um, with the number of students under each person's supervision. And, uh, and so if we have some form of IT, some form of uh, programs that will help us do some quick assessments and the rest. A lot of resources in Africa also are not online. And so if, even if you sometimes have an IT setting to test some of that, if they are not online, um, it can be a problem. But I have observed that some of the materials that are registered uh, they have ISBN numbers, uh, and the libraries have done their work. You can always tell uh, some, something about that. But a, a number of resources in Africa, even published resources, do not have ISBN numbers and are not, are not really well distributed uh, for people to have access to and be able to make uh, effective assessment. But I think we are on the way and we can make some improvements in this direction. There's a need to affirm that plagiarism is compromise of academic and Christian integrity. Uh, and so we must respond to it. There are scriptural basis to do that. I've treat three texts here. Second Timothy 2.15 says, do, not, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of God. Christian research is interpretation of scripture and must be handled appropriately. Titus Two seven, in everything, set yourself an example by doing what is good. Research is good. In your teaching, show integrity and seriousness. And when we show integrity and seriousness, we uh, in research, then we are doing biblical, godly research. And the third text there talks about we must have reputation to outsiders. Those in the church and those outside the church. Uh, and so there's a need for us to encourage uh, proper research that uh, 
will inform and educate our context. Thank you. Can you clap for him, please? <laughs> Could you take about two minutes? You, you've focused mostly on plagiarism, and you didn't really allude to cheating, and this is what I've heard. Well, you know, in Africa, we're relational people, and we help each other. And so when we're sitting in the classroom and we're taking the quiz and the teacher's not looking and my friend needs help, it's right for me to show him my answers so that, that somehow that's how we help each other. And, and, and it's a cultural response and I, I, I wonder what you, how you would respond to that. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's also cheating. It's <laughs> <laughs> and I respond to that. I, I've had to respond to that in various ways. Sometimes if it's like a pop test, I've had to seize such paper and you miss that test and it's going to affect your grade. Maybe I've done that um, several times. <laughs> um, and uh, as an institution, we have had to discipline students who had done that. Um, the, simply uh, find evidence and clear evidence that this was done and uh, suspensions have been given to students uh, for uh, such kind of such kind of work um, so, so do you even think in that's exams a, do you think that's a sinful behavior or a cultural behavior it's a sinful behavior but the students may have come into it from some of the factors I mentioned in my introduction, uh, that uh, they are coming from a context, I need something, my friend can help me, and, I, and the, the corruption of society has gone to so many levels, and uh, the, the church needs to set an example uh, of say, saying, this is not acceptable uh, as a Christian. And if you, need an, uh, if you need help, you should seek the help before the exams. And there are actually other levels of, uh, of uh, lack of academic integrity that um, we could look at. I noted on my paper, but not on the PowerPoint. And that includes examinations, school tests, and also research by graduates or research that is not supervised. I have seen some who would, after graduation, would take something and publish, and it's actually one of their teachers um, teaching content. Um, or, or, or a friend's work, just take it and publish it. Uh, someone will say, oh, let me see that your paper. And before you know it, he has published it. <laughs> you know? Uh, and so there, there are many other, other forms of um, misuse of information in, in our society and that, that we can provide response to. Thank you, brother. Okay, take five minutes and share the two best things that you're doing at your school to address this. It might be a pedagogical thing. It might be clear approach, dynamic conciliar approach, what, whatever, just do that and then we'll hear some, re some responses. <laughs> Dr. Audi is there, he'll answer, he can use that mic and answer if you have questions. Oh, I'm just talking, guys. Hello. Thank you. Yeah. So um, he'll be there, he'll answer at that mic if, uh, if you have questions for him or about his presentation. But, um, but who can share, us, share with us some of the really good things that you've done and learned that can help the rest of us? This is a contribution. Can I go ahead? Can I'm we? sorry? Yes. Contribution. Please. Uh, Dr. Audi. My contribution is that many times we assume that the students know the examination regulations. Of course, we have published the examination regulations in the handbook and in other manuals. But how many times do the students get to know these regulations? It may be helpful just before any examination begins. 
that will remind the students those cogent points about those regulations that are already codified. Let, don't let us make any assumption. My colleague from Nigeria and I were talking about one we probably don't want to talk about, and that's faculty integrity and professorial integrity. So if we're going to look at our students and their plagiarism, we have to make sure that we also model that for our students. Good afternoon. afternoon. Mine is not uh, actually uh, something we are doing. My name is Florence and I work for ACTI, but it's something that we have discovered every time that we visit institutions. Uh, we realize that uh, we find institutions uh, printing almost every textbook. An institution buys one book, prints a thousand, or well, a hundred copies of the same book, yeah. put them in for the students to use. And then we have been to classes where the students use those notes. Actually, a teacher takes the same textbook, uh, creates notes from the same textbook without actually acknowledging that this is coming from here. And then you find a student uh, doing their work or writing a paper using the teacher's note exactly the same thing. So actually, I think one of the things we need also to address in, this, in our institution is, are we also encouraging plagiarism from the root of the teacher? Well, from an institution printing a whole book over and over again, and a teacher also taking the notes without acknowledging where it is coming from. So at what point does a student standing and say, well, for a lecturer to accuse a student that you plagiarize, yet they have also seen lecturers do that. Yeah. Wow, so is there someone who won't make us feel bad that can say something? I, I hope mine doesn't make us feel bad. I have three tools that we've developed to use. Um, in our institutional context. Um, number one, thank you for mentioning the discipleship piece. That's really important for us. Um, I, as the dean, I have 10 to 15 of these conversations every year in my office, and I try, but the last thing I say to them is let's pray together and thank God that he has allowed this to be revealed as a character issue in your life. And I want them to know that I'm actually thankful that I'm having this conversation. Because in the bigger character picture, this is God's window into their lives that God has given me the chance to see something that they need to work on, and so we can have that conversation together. And that's huge. It's massive. Uh, no, that's number one. Number two, um, one thing we developed this year, we just did it in our faculty in-service in January. Uh, we know that they use Google against us, so let's take their weapon and use it against them. And so we did faculty training this year on using Google to find plagiarism. It's actually not hard. There's only two skills. Okay. Seeing it and searching it. That's all it is. And so if we can train our faculty to do random search strings. I know Grammarly and the big, the big ones are 100% filters. Since most of the plagiarism is coming from Google anyway, it's, it's a 90% filter if we can use it well. So training our faculty to use Google to do random search strings, identifying it and finding it. It's a, it's a fairly yeah. safe okay. filter. Okay. Um, I forgot what the third one was, so I'll stick with those two. Uh, yeah, I tell my students I have the same Google they do. So on day one, hopefully that helps. Well, I know that I mean, for our uh, policy on, on plagiarism is a part of our accreditation, so we have to. But I don't think a policy is never enough. So I know one of the things that we've been doing that's been helpful is the first is we have a course on research methodology in which a large component of it is what is plagiarism, and how does it look like, We're trying to define that, and then we are told as faculty, as much as possible in every course, every course I teach, when I talk about the assignments, I explain plagiarism again, and go through, you know, what we're going to tell them, what you know right now, that's good, anything you add in your paper that you didn't know right this moment, then be sure that you tell me where you got it from, and so we're trying to be proactive, but I think the, the, the course has helped a lot. Although we still, a lot of repetition, a lot of just speaking into it. And, and even if it's the same student, you're still speaking into it again. Very good. Yeah, uh, just, just following on from Dr. Davies, at Cape Town Baptist Seminary, and part of regulation is not only that we uh, inform the student of the impact of plagiarism, but we actually help the student prevent it from happening. And so what we have is uh, a very simple application called Grammarly, and the student is required to 
uh, to first uh, send this paper through Grammarly, uh, and Grammarly will identify all the online courses uh, so that it can actually reference it. Uh, so that is a way of actually preventing the student very intentionally from uh, plagiarizing. So it's a, it's a very cheap system actually, uh, and actually helps the student also to correct his grammar uh, at the same time. So, so let me get that, that's Grammarly? Grammarly, yeah. Okay, good. My name is Nathan, I teach English and research at UBS in Uganda. One more of those. I'm trying to be scholarly with all these scholars in the room. <laughs> I feel a little low. Um, yeah, so I teach English and research at UBS and fundamentally what I've seen in that the education system in Sub-Saharan Africa is uh, memorization and rote. So as soon as they, students come in to our academic institution, we're fighting against years of learning, right? So that's kind of what we've been hearing, unlearning, removing stone, or whatever. And so my encouragement to you as educators is to uh, promote assignments that force creativity. And so, whereas instead of assigning a biography or a summary of a chapter of the Bible, get creative in your assignments in which force students to have to create because um, it's just an uphill battle. So creating is always the highest level of thinking within education. So that would be my one encouragement. Um, before, before Patrick speaks, let me say this. Um, I would also like to hear when they're caught. What, 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 what's the most redemptive, helpful process that you have, um, that you've employed? Yes, sir. Okay, to respond immediately to your question, um, at the Baptist Seminary in, in Zimbabwe, it's an immediate faith. We tell the student, because you plagiarized, you've just done copy and paste, you've not thought it through, that's a sign of laziness, so laziness equals death. <laughs> <laughs> but I also want to say that this is a two-way problem, like someone else has mentioned before. The, the lecturer and the student should shoulder the blame to some degree. <clears throat> there's, there's a problem in our classrooms, especially here in Africa, with the proficiency of the English language. All our textbooks in our seminaries, or in most of our seminaries, are in English. There's very few in the local languages. And yet, our students are coming into our seminary not being proficient with the English language and expected to study textbooks that are written in English and be able to process that information and then put it down on paper in the way that they best understand what they've seen in the textbook. And that process is difficult if they are not helped by the lecturer in the classroom. If the lecturer himself or if the lecturer herself is not proficient with the English language, which is the official medium of communication, it becomes a, a problem for the student and we can't solely blame the student for failing in his or her responsibility. Uh, English is the official universal language. In Zimbabwe, English is the, constitutionally it is the official language of the country. And yet, we have students who are battling to go through the semester and cover their subjects adequately <coughs> and produce good results at the end. So communication skills is something that needs to be taught in our schools. If theological education is going to be as effective as we want it to be, we have to emphasize this whole field of communication because we seem to be producing people who are passing, quote unquote, passing in, our, in their exams. But actually when they get out into the field, they are 
unable to communicate. They, they, they are dysfunctional when it comes to communicating the word of God. And then we wonder why our churches are not growing. We wonder why our churches are not effective in our community. And I've been telling our students, gone are the days when the pastor was the most educated person in the community. Those days are gone. They've expired. We're now sitting with people who have degrees in our congregation. And some of them are just frustrated to listen to a product that is coming out of our seminary and saying, I would rather look for another church where things are done professionally. So I think we need to do that professionally. The content of our lesson on the principles of research needs to be studied thoroughly by the professor or the, or the lecturer that is handling that subject and make sure that the students are proficient in the way that they carry out their work before they graduate. The Nigerian Baptist Theological Seminary, Obumasho, had to adopt the plagiarizing policy three academic sessions ago. Prior to that time, uh, we've had statements, the like of which you put up during your presentation. But three academic sessions ago, we came to uh, a definite awareness of the need for a greater statement. So three, four, five page documents uh, promoting work honesty, alighting issues of academic integrity with particular emphasis plagiarism. And then we came to a very, uh, very serious realization, the kind of which somebody mentioned earlier on, that for the first time we now came to understand that many, many students don't really have a definite understanding of what we consider to be plagiarism. Some of these examples of getting help from one person or the other were not really considered to be plagiarism until we have to sit down and look at very specific examples. And we also have to conduct two or three faculty workshops to help faculty members. Because we discover that even faculty members were very soft on this issue of plagiarism because it appears as if they themselves are not very sure about what really constitutes a plagiarism. And then, based upon that, we also have to conduct workshops for students. Every student goes through orientation, part of which is the academic policy. But then, we needed also to organize a special forum for this. And at the end of it, we came to the conclusion that if it is the first offense you are warned, the work is rejected. Either you fail in part or you fail the whole course in whole and then you repeat it. After the second uh, offense, then we inform the church that has recommended you to let you, to let the church be aware that you're having a moral issue with regards to your academic integrity and performance. And if you repeat that for the third time, then you are expelled from the school. So far, we have not had reason to expel anyone, but we have had reason to fail many on the number of uh, courses and also even to delay their graduation for one or even two, two years. We work with Grammarly. It's, every student has it and every faculty member also has it. Thank you. That's great. I, I, I don't know who has, but one of your schools, I don't know who it is, but one of your schools, if you find a student that does plagiarism or that does that, you have, you've told me you have them write a biblical theological essay on why that's wrong and have them, have them work through that themselves and their ability to stay in the school depends on how well they write that and that they don't but that um, <laughs> but how, how, how well they write that response. Is there, am, I, am I just, did I read that one night or was there a school that did that? That that yeah. So who? But who? Who was the school that was doing that? Okay. All right. Sorry. I saw another hand. But anyway, I think that's a great idea. Having having the students because at some level, so everybody has their own idea of what's right and what's wrong, and we don't always necessarily. And we might. And what what is the severity of that, how, how, how is it wrong but not so bad kind of thing, and having them work through that and them actually writing a, 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 a strongly referenced biblical response to that, um, it, it helped them work through the issue for themselves, and it was a discipleship approach 
as much as it was a uh, uh, punishment. Yeah, somebody else had their hand up? Uh, back at our college, we have simplified this in a more layman language by telling the student that academic stealing is just the same as the pastor stealing from the orphan. So by doing that, we tell them that, you know, if you are stealing from the offering, what's going to happen? The church will start. So if, if you are stealing academically, will the school will start. That's all. <laughs> okay, we're, we're, we're past lunch, so we're going to take one more. It's coming. It's coming. And it's, I just want to introduce you. It's Deanna Schatz. Go ahead. I just want to say that on the website, on the ABTEM website, there are some resources for dealing with plagiarism. It's on the resources page. I shared it last year in my presentation. So go to that resources page from last year's presentation and look for some of them. Wow, thank you very much.